<laughs> well, welcome to this week's learning space. Uh, my name is Nicole Gallucci. I'm a postdoc with the CosmoQuest project. Uh, and with me, I have my co-host. Hmm. This side? Oh. This side? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and introduce yourself, Georgia. Hello. I'm, George I'm Georgia Bracey. I'm a formal education lead for CosmoQuest. And uh, we are joined this week by Brian Lynch. This side. This side. <laughs> I can never remember. It's mirrored. Uh, Ryan is a postdoc at McGill University. Hello. Hello. I think we have a bit of a delay. Um, so uh, this week, uh, for our little... Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we... I think we have a bit of a delay. Um, we do. It's very... Um, it's kind of freezing up a little bit, at least from my end. So okay. we'll... see what we can do. We'll work, we'll work with it. Uh, as usual, you guys can ask us questions. I have the comment tracker up. Um, oh, good question. I have the comment tracker up. Uh, so if you leave a comment on the YouTube page, if you're watching it there, we'll see your comments. On the event page, on uh, Google+, Plus, anywhere this is playing, we should be able to pick those up as well. And if you are watching elsewhere, and want to leave a comment on Twitter, use the hashtag learning space. Uh, that will get to us. Uh, we've already got a question from Chris Rand asking where Commander Chuck is. Commander Chuck <laughs> is, uh -huh. is, I think he got upgraded from Captain to Commander. Commander Chuck is, uh, is uh, still at home in my suitcase. I haven't fully unpacked from Chile. I took Chuck to uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter Ray with me. And uh, my suitcase is, is just open on the floor with stuff bulging out of it. So that's where Chuck is. I do, however, have a stand-in. Somebody gave me my own rubber chicken. So Ooh. I have one of Camilla's family Clones. members. <laughs> so there's no shortage of ridiculous things on my desk. Um, I wanted to do a brief demo since today is the spring equinox. I don't know mm. how prevalent this, this um, uh, I don't know what you would call this, uh, astronomy misunderstanding is that you can stand an egg on end at the moment of the equinox. Is this still a thing that um, I, I remember this was a thing you used to see school children doing on the news, like right, standing all these eggs on end at the exact moment of the equinox, right? And I think this has been debunked time and time again on various astronomy websites. Thank you, Phil Plate. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I don't think, I don't know that you hear about it as much as you used to maybe four or five internet. years ago. And maybe, yeah, we can thank, we can uh, thank. Phil and, and people like him for that. But uh, it's still kind of, a, it's still out there. It's still and, out there. And just because it's debunked doesn't mean I won't keep trying. Um, so... <laughs> Let me see if I can get this. So here's my egg. This is a normal egg. Uh, it's it's not hard boiled yet. That's how I prefer them. Uh, so I played with this a bit this morning just to prove to myself that I still could stand an egg on end at you know any time of the day or year. Um, so this is not a good thing necessarily to do on the equinox because someone might get the impression that oh it's on the day maybe that counts you know. Think of it, you know, if you're if you're covering this in your in your lessons, you know, something about the seasons, or maybe in a few weeks, um, I think Easter's coming up. Uh, if you celebrate Easter, uh, you might be coloring eggs for that. And I'm completely failing at this. <laughs> I got it this morning. Um, if you're coloring eggs with your kids, you can note, you know, this particular misunderstanding and get them to try and balance the eggs on end before they're hard-boiled. This is really boring, me failing at this. I totally got it this morning, I swear. <laughs> I went through several eggs working in my fridge to yeah. find one that had the right... Aha! Look at that. <laughs> oh. All right, let me try and not knock it over. So, yeah, it is, it is, it is many, many hours past the equinox, and I can still balance an egg on end, so... This is one of those fun little debunking things you could try at home. <laughs> and now I'm going to try and put that back in its little cradle so I can take it home. <laughs> yeah, that's tomorrow's breakfast. There you go. I can have my triple, triple, mm. triple egg chutney chili sandwich. <laughs> All you Red Dwarf fans. It's a good thing. Oh. Okay. That does sound kind of good. <laughs> it's surprisingly good. So there you go. Balancing an egg on end. Do it any day of the year. Uh, it has nothing to do with the equinox. And, it, and, and, you know, of course, if your kids are asking you, 
well, why would it work? Why would it not work? Try and get them to think of what mechanism would make an egg stand on end. Um, it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, can, can you say anything about the gravity? And that actually gets you into explaining what happens on the equinox, where the Earth is in relation to the sun, and things like that. So that's my cheapo demo <laughs> of the week. Cool um, thing to do for the week. Yes, that's my cool thing to do for the week. That's what I got. That's all I got. My brain's still scrambled from, from travel. Um, so we would like to get to the main topic for this week. Uh, so we are talking to Ryan about uh, education and outreach and opportunities through a project called NanoGrav. Am I saying this right? NanoGrav. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I was getting the acronym wrong earlier. Um, so can you give us an overview of, of what is NanoGrav? What is this project? Yeah. So NanoGrav is a collaboration of astronomers and physicists and technology experts from over a dozen different institutions across North America, mostly in the United States but also in Canada. The acronym stands for North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. Um, and the whole goal of the project is to search for and directly detect and study uh, gravitational waves and sources of gravitational waves using objects, objects called uh, pulsars. So gravitational waves are, we think of them as these ripples in space-time. And to really sort of understand them in detail, you have to talk about Einstein's view of gravity, the concept that gravity is the distortion in sort of the distance between objects and the rate at which clocks tick. And we call that space-time. And you can sort of think of it as sort of having like a rubber sheet or something like that. You place something heavy on it, it causes the sheet to curve. Um, it's sort of an imperfect analogy, but it's good for sort of picturing in your head what's going on. And in this picture, gravitational waves are like ripples on the surface of that sheet. And pulsars, um, which are not immediately related to that, are these dead stars. They're spinning very, very fast, and in some cases as fast as your kitchen blender or faster. I think my, the fastest speed my kitchen blender goes at is something like 400 hertz. Um, it's convenient because it has little RPM uh, indicators on it. So the fastest pulsar spins at 716 hertz, so 716 rotations in one second. And they're beaming radio waves from highly magnetized surface. And so the picture to have in your mind is kind of like a lighthouse, an interstellar lighthouse. But what we use them for in nanograv is actually kind of like clocks where each time that lighthouse beam points at us, we see a pulse, and that's kind of like the tick of a clock. And what we're looking for are very, very tiny changes in the rate at which these pulsars appear to tick that's being caused by uh, the effects of gravitational waves on the Earth, actually. So that's the whole goal of the project, um, but it's really quite a large collaboration. Uh, it, to do that, it takes a, you know, you have to understand the pulsars, you have to understand and how the signal is affected as it travels to the Earth. You have to have build really good instruments. You have to know what to look for in gravitational waves. Um, so it, it's a really broad project with a lot of different applications across all of physics. And what kind of telescopes are being used? Um, yeah, so, so Nanograv primarily uses uh, two radio telescopes, uh, the Green Bank Telescope in, uh -oh. in Green Bank, West Virginia, and the Arecibo Telescope in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. Um, Arecibo is the largest uh, sing single dish radio telescope in the world. It's 300 meters in diameter. But it, because it's so big, you can't steer it around. So it really only looks straight up and a little bit side to side. There's some games you can play with the way that it focuses hmm. um, that lets you see off to the side a little bit. The GBT is smaller. It's only a, a, a puny 100 meters in diameter. So it's only like having a, a football uh, size field yeah. telescope instead of three football fields. But it can point basically anywhere in the sky. And so you can see a much uh, larger portion of the sky. So Arecibo is extremely sensitive. It's a great telescope to use for the pulsars that it can see. But one of the things that allow, makes our detection of gravitational waves more sensitive, we hope, is to have pulsars spread out across the sky. So we really want to be able to see pulsars not just in the narrow strip on the sky, but all over. And so the GBT, um, which is you know, one of the best telescopes um, aside from Arecibo, in terms of its sensitivity and the fact that you can point it anywhere is really important for that. So um, I noticed under the Who We Are section of the Nanograph website, uh, it involves high school students as well as, as collaborators. Mm -hmm. So how do high school students get involved in this project? Yeah, so there's a lot of different steps um, 
if you want to try and go from pulsars to gravitational wave detection. And again, we haven't dete directly detected gravitational waves yet. We're hoping that Nanograv does this first in collaboration with some other international uh, team members. Um, so first you want to have pulsars and you want to have the brightest pulsars that are spinning the fastest. These are called millisecond pulsars. And the reason you want bright millisecond pulsars is that they make the best clocks. Mm -hmm. So you, we, have, we know of several bright millisecond pulsars that we are observing regularly, but we always want more. So the first step towards building a more sensitive gravitational wave, wave detector using pulsars is to find more pulsars. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is really great for high school students to get involved in because you take data at the telescope, you run it through some automatic pipelines, you use uh, supercomputers to crunch the numbers, and what you get out is plots that are what the computer algorithm thought was a good candidate pulsar. But you really need a human trained eye to go through and look at these candidates because a lot of the times they're going to be man-made signals um, that we call radio frequency interference or RFI that might look like a pulsar but are completely uh, unrelated to anything in space. They're just uh, sources from something here on the Earth. And in other cases, you might just have a signal which is random noise, but it just happened to look like a weak pulsar. Um, so the high school students, um, primarily through two projects, the, something called the Pulsar Search Collaboratory mm -hmm. and the Arecibo Remote Command Center, uh, help us to look through these candidate pulsars and to uh, actually identify the best candidates and oftentimes find real pulsars. And through those two programs, they've found several, over a dozen pulsars. I'm not sure the exact number off the top of my head. A few of which are very interesting MSPs. These millisecond pulsars, I should say. Yeah, was one of those students was, um, I'm remembering, there have been several stories of these high school students who have mm -hmm. discovered pulsars through these projects. Uh, one of them was hanging out with President Obama for the star party on the... Yeah. I'm yeah, this White House. years ago now. So this was a, a Pulsar Search Collaboratory, uh, collaboratory student um, who found the first astrophysical uh, source in the Pulsar Search Collaboratory data. So one of the cool things about the Pulsar Search Collaboratory is that this was data taken with the Green Bank Telescope as part of a larger Pulsar survey, mm -hmm. but a portion of it was set aside just for the high school students to look at. So no other professional astronomers actually have access to look at the data. So it's their own data. They, they really own it. The discoveries are their own. Um, they, of course, have professional astronomers to help mentor them and, and, and teachers to give them guidance. Um, but we can't go in and try and scoop them. or Not that we would scoop them, but we can't get a little bit too eager and go in. None of you guys photos. would. I know you guys are good. <laughs> but um, just the temptation isn't there. Um, but uh, Lucas was, uh, was his name, was the first student to actually find a, an astrophysical source. It actually wasn't a pulsar in a typical sense. We think it was uh, something that's kind of like a pulsar. It's the same underlying physical object, but it doesn't emit radio waves regularly. Mm -hmm. We call them rotating radio transients. They're bursty. And you know, we were very excited about this, so we tried to publicize it. And I'm not exactly sure how, but someone in the White House press office, I, was, I would assume, uh, caught wind of it. And Luke was invited to the White House for a star party in the International Year of Astronomy. So he got to meet the president, uh, along with another student who I think discovered a supernova. Very cool. How That's many good. students, could, could, do you have an estimate of how many students have participated in this project so far? Um, it's, we have partnerships with dozens of high schools throughout West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, and I know I'm going to probably miss some states, um, and then down Tennessee, and then there's also sort of a PSC West um, in uh, Wisconsin, maybe a couple other states out Midwest, and we have uh, several hundred students that have gone through the program, um, and, and many teachers as well. Um, and that's just with the PSC. The ARC, which is the Air Cibo Re uh, Remote Command Center, um, which is based out of the University of Texas at Brownsville, um, has had several dozen undergraduates and some other high school students help with that as well. And that there's also an ARC sort of location at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Okay. So. so that means they have a control room that's not at Arecibo, but... Yeah, exactly. So, so ARC has a really great setup. Um, they basically have a control room where they can help, where they do observations with the Arecibo telescope remotely uh, from a computer, and it's decked out to look like the bridge of the, uh, the Star Trek... The, the oh, Starship Enterprise right. from Star Trek. I have Trek, seen that, like yeah. Like the original 70s version, not, not the, uh, the newer ones. 
So it, it's actually pretty pretty cool. I okay. I've seen pictures. I've never been there. I've seen pictures of it. That is so cool. <laughs> Yeah. All telescope control rooms should look like the Enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> I know, well, you, most telescope control rooms have a lot of computer screens all over the place. They feel so powerful. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. And it's really well, cool. Oh, Are the saying? sound effects the same, though? That's my question. You get the good you sound effects. There might be some sound effects that are the same. <laughs> Hopefully you don't hear like the red alert thing going off too often, because that's usually mm -hmm. a bad sign when you're controlling a... Well, um, if you're at the you know, very radio. large array, there's a lightning alert that, that kind of Ooh, would be the that closest was... thing to the red alert. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely <laughs> a lightning alert. not so bad. Telescopes can handle lightning. Yeah, usually. but the people outside you have to warn. Sometimes yeah. there, are, there are people working outside. Or tour guides. <laughs> they yeah. have to rush their <laughs> tours in. I've got that. Oh. Oh, cool. Oh, so um, why do you, so I think you talked a little bit about this already, but why um, pulsar seem to be a ripe field of study for students? Mm -hmm. um, why do you think pulsars in particular have picked up this 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 group of high schoolers that are are all these different high schools that are working on it? Well, first of all, I mean, I think pulsars are, are pretty cool, yeah. and <laughs> I think other people tend to think they're pretty cool once they hear about them. I'm a little bit biased because that's what I study, but I mean, they're incredible. Right? You have these dead stars. Um, the density is equivalent to taking all six or seven billion, the, the exact number actually doesn't make that much of a difference, people in the world and cram them into a space the size of a sugar cube. Um, it's about the size of a large city, about 10 kilometers, 12 kilometers in diameter. They're spinning as fast as your kitchen blender. The magnetic fields are so strong that if you were to put a pulsar at the distance of the moon, um, they weigh one and a half times as much as the sun, so gravitationally would rip the Earth apart. But the magnetic fields would also erase all of the computer hard drives and credit cards on the Earth because <gasps> they're so strong. So, I mean, they're absolutely wild objects, right? There's nothing else like them in the universe. There's nothing that we can create on Earth which is like that. We really wouldn't want to. Either. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, so I think that they're I think that they're just exciting things to study. So I think that's one thing that makes them really appealing. Um, the other thing is that you can use them to do really cutting edge science. Um, Astronomy tends to be a field of sometimes low precision, at least historically. Um, you know, if we can tell the mass of a galaxy to 10 or 15 percent, then that's usually pretty good. Um, it's just because making these types of measurements are hard, and the data isn't often of you know high enough quality that you can really get down to like a you know below a one percent level in your measurement. Um, and that's just sort of the world that we live in. But pulsars, because they spin so fast and are such precise clocks lets you do really precise measurements. Um, you know, the, some of the most precise tests of general relativity in, in very strong gravity have come from pulsars, the most pre precise tests have. And we can uh, you know, study things like this to incredible, incredible precision that you just can't do with anything else in astronomy. Um, and so I think that that's another thing. You can use it to study general relativity. You can use it them to hunt for planets. You can use them to detect gravitational waves. You can use them to study um, you know, quantum physics, they, they really are nature's laboratories for studying extreme science, um, which also makes them really cool. Right. And then the other thing is that one of the, the big things that we do is search for new pulsars, because we have not detected all the pulsars in the galaxy, we know that we're still sort of limited by the sensitivity of our telescopes, um, and historically, before, you know, around the year 2000 or the late 90s, um, we were also limited by the computing power that we had. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's all these new pulsars out there, and every time that we look for new pulsars, we end up finding something which is totally unique that we haven't, you know, we weren't expecting and that we haven't seen before. So we know of about 2,000 pulsars and a few hundred of these millisecond pulsars, but we're still finding ones that are completely different from any of the others. And that process of finding pulsars is something that, you know, people can get, can get into even if they don't have a lot of expertise in astronomy or in pulsar science itself okay. because, again, a lot of it is learning to recognize patterns in these uh, plots of candidates and, and looking to identify the right things. And then when you do that, you can learn more about the, the science that is behind all of that. Oh, that's great, yeah. So how would um, high school teachers get involved if they think they might like to try something like this with their students? What's the best way to go about getting started? Yeah. So the, the Pulsar Search Collaboratory, um, we're, we're in the process of trying to think about how we want to try and scale that up and take it to the next level, the original funding is now, I think, pretty much gone. Um, <laughs> it, it was a five. Uh, it, it went for five years. It's still active. Mm -hmm. It's not sort of being um, 
scaled up at this point, but that's something that we're looking into. Um, there's also uh, programs you can download on your computer. Some, one of them is called uh, Einstein at Home, which is sort of like the SETI at Home uh, mm -hmm. right. program that allows you to uh, search for signals from extraterrestrials in, in the SETI project. This uh, is a project to search for pulsars and pulsar data, specifically from the uh, P-alpha survey, which is a survey done with the Arecibo telescope. Um, here, you're using your idle CPU time to actually analyze small chunks of data. So you're not looking through the plot. It's not quite as interactive. Right, um, right, right. But it's still the way that you can contribute. And that, that project, Einstein at Home, has found, I think, 23 pulsars in the P-alpha survey. And so those were pulsars that were basically found um, thanks to the resources that were volunteered by people all over the world. Mm, that's cool. Yeah, really cool. Um, any middle school age kids or schools involved, or is it Mostly it's been high school, um, but we actually have as part of the PSC a couple middle schools that were involved as well. Okay, I thought That's I saw that too. somewhere on your website, but I figured it was mostly high school, but... Yeah, we have, we've had a few. It's uh, mostly high school, but, but we've had some middle school students too. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions about the science itself from Jonathan Langdale. Uh, just to confirm, gravity is not instantaneous, and would gravity waves be the first direct evidence of this? Right, so um, he's correct that gravity does not act instantaneously. Um, no information can travel faster than the speed of light. Um, this is one of the consequences of Einstein's theory, and that includes um, uh, gravity as well. Um, would gravitational waves be the first direct confirmation of this? Um, I actually don't. Let me think about that. I know it's built into the theory somehow. Yeah. Um, um, I don't actually know if that has ever been ex experimentally verified, mm -hmm. that, that gravity travels at the speed of light um, as well. So I don't actually have a good answer to that question. Okay. But it, I would say that gra we have never directly detected gravitational waves before. We have had indirect evidence for them right. in, in terms of seeing the energy, energy that they carry away. Uh, this is actually a, a, an experiment done with pulsars that won a Nobel Prize um, for the first strong evidence for this. Um, so nanograv is not the only project trying to directly detect gravitational waves, but you know, we are hoping that we might be one of the first. And even if we're not, uh, the types of sources of gravitational waves that we're going to see, um, merging supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies and That's relic weird. gravitational waves from inflation in the very early universe and possibly from these objects called cosmic strings. Um, other experiments are not sensitive to those particular sources. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, using these, what we call pulsar timing arrays, which is the, the heart of what nanograv really is, um, really are a unique way of probing uh, the gravitational wave universe. And when we do detect it, we are going to open up a whole new window into the universe because you know, anything that doesn't really emit light but does emit gravitational waves, like two black holes that are orbiting each other, um, this is going to be you know, the best way to study them. And I'm sure that we're going to... I would, I, would, I would bet a significant amount of money that we're going to see things that we didn't expect. Because whenever you oh, open yeah. up windows on things, you always find things you didn't expect. The universe is always throwing surprises at you. So, Jonathan's also wondering if it's easier to balance an egg if a gravitational wave is passing by. And I imagine that would make it harder. Um, yeah, so the actual effect of a gravitational wave is to cause basically a, a, a very small shrinking and stretching. Yeah. Um, I don't think it would actually have very much uh, impact on the egg because... Um, it's a, it, the, the amount that you're shrinking and stretching is sort of a relative, it's a fractional change. Mm -hmm. And gravitational waves are really weak, it's why we haven't directly detected them before, and that egg would probably change its, uh, its height and, by less than an atom. But can I still blame it on that, my inability to... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely, yes. You can blame it on whatever you want, but the, the, you, the roughness in your table, just from <laughs> irregularities in the surface, is probably much larger than, than a gravitational <laughs> wave would be. So. All right, I'll blame the table. Blame um, the so table. <laughs> I wanted to, okay, so getting back to um, student involvement, and you said you've been mm -hmm. talking about expanding the Pulsar Search Collaboratory in particular. Are there any plans to involve, I mean, I'm asking this, you know, from, from CosmoQuest, are there any plans to involve the public beyond um, students in schools? Um, that's one of the things that we've sort of, um, been talking about 
uh, for the Topolistic Search Collaboratory, if we want to take it you know, on the model of like Galaxy Zoo or, or what we, exactly we want to do. So that, that's a possibility um, for down the road. But um, if getting directly involved, that's probably one of the ways, but just in terms of sort of staying up to date with what's going on mm -hmm. um, and sort of benefiting from the resources we're putting together, I keep talking about the Polter Search Collaboratory, but that's actually sort of a separate but related project to NanoGrab. NanoGrab, we have a whole other outreach effort there as well, and it's sort of in the early stages. We've only um, sort of been going full force on the outreach front for a few months now. But we're in the process of putting together a podcast series, a um, series of YouTube sort of instructional videos in the style of Khan Academy. We're actually going to be in the, the, in the very near future, within the next week or two, talking with uh, some, some of the teachers from the Paul Source Social Collaboratory to ask them, what do you need mm -hmm. in, for your classroom? What sort of resources can we develop that are going to be useful to you? We're going to start to develop lesson plans, probably depending on the kind of feedback we get to go get along, along with the podcasts, with the YouTube lectures. Um, I would love to get to the point where we can put together sort of self-contained kits that teach sort of yeah. the, some of the fundamental science behind NanoGrab and be able to send those out to teachers or to anyone in, gen in the general public um, that, that they can use that for. So we have lots of ideas along uh, those lines where people can still sort of learn the science um, in a hands-on sort of way. Do you have an idea of what teachers are already using maybe to go around um, there's, you know, as our students do this activity or participate, um, anything in the classroom that they're already sort of developing, lesson plans, that kind of thing, or so I don't I, know if you have a chance to talk with them at length about that. Yeah, so for the Pulsar Search Collaboratory, um, sort of the model that it's used is that a core group of students will sort of come to Green Bank, or, and this is how it was done, they would sort of get a you know, crash course in pulsar astronomy along with the teachers. They would then go back to their schools and try and sort of teams. And so it was a lot, very much up to the teachers to um, sort of you know, decide what direction they wanted to take it in there. Some teachers incorporated it into their actual classroom activities where they would, uh, they would have a small project where students had to look through so many plots. Other teachers built up after school clubs around it and got involved with a whole bunch of other types of astronomy. Um, a lot of the time, um, so part of the, the Pulse Research Laboratory was at the end of the year, um, students would be invited to West Virginia University for a capstone event where they would yeah. sort of have a, they would present results in, sci in sort of like a scientific poster session. That's awesome, yeah. Very um, nice. To the astronomers and whatnot. Cool. So there were some things like that. As far as um, <clears throat> like little hands on demos, I saw one at the AAS meeting, the last American Astronomical Society meeting. It looked like a ball of clay that they had stuck two red LEDs in as if they were the beams mm -hmm. of the pulsar, just hung it on a string and let that spin freely as kind of um, a hands-on demonstration of what a pulsar might look like. Um, yeah, I've seen something similar like using uh, a little, one of those little handheld fans that it actually, you stick it on there and it actually spins. And uh, <laughs> the teacher who had set that up was talking about trying to get like just a little camera and actually looking for the pulses of light and, that's, and you basically see the pulses like you would from a radio, with a radio telescope from a pulsar. Cool. Um, so you can actually collect this pulsar data, and uh, you, know, you, can, you can try and analyze it, try and measure how fast it's spinning and that sort of thing. Oh, that's cool. Um, can you think of any, do you have any other um, pulsar radio astronomy resources that people might, that already exist that people might want to check out, or uh, stuff that you're planning on adding to the NanoGrav research, uh, outreach efforts? Yeah, so um, we just started putting together a podcast series, which I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So that's now up in the iTunes store. Okay, I'll put a link to that in the in the awesome. um, events, and that'll go in the show notes on YouTube. Yeah, so we we just sort of put the first few up. We're in the process of trying to record more, and the idea here is to basically you know interview people who are actually involved in Nanograph to have them tell people what they're doing, Great. as well as students who are traveling abroad. International participation is one of the big uh, parts of Nanograph. It, it's actually just part of. Uh, a larger international effort called the International Pulsar Timing Array, which is a partnership between Nanograv and similar projects in Europe and Australia. And so there's all a lot the of continents. international. <laughs> all the continents. All, yeah, we want all the continents. <laughs> um, and so we're going to be talking to students about the experiences that they've had um, traveling abroad, just in terms of the, you know, the fun things that they've learned, the people that they've met. Um, and then there was also the YouTube videos. Um, so those are sort of the, the main thrusts that we're, that we're looking at right now. Eventually, we're also going to redesign our web page to try and 
put more uh, information for the public, videos um, and animations to sort of illustrate key concepts, um, as well as you know, simple explanations of, of uh, the types of science that are going on. Um, in terms of broader sort of uh, Pulsar-related outreach uh, materials, um, some of our international partners um, can, you know, put together some very interesting things. I'm not going to remember the website off the top of my head, but uh, I think it's the University of Birmingham in the UK has a gravitational wave optics website where you can, uh, they basically use the actual equations of general relativity um, and your webcam to uh, distort the image in you know, the way that, say, like a black hole might do if you were sitting, if there's a black oh, hole in front cool. of you, you can actually see it uh, bending around you and that sort of thing. So uh, I think it's gravitational wave optics or something like that that people can look up, which is very cool. Um, and so that that's a great thing to, it's almost like a funhouse mirror or something like that, but it's uh, you know, correct, physically correct in, in terms of the uh, the equations of Einstein. Is this, hmm, I'm looking for it now, but I'll look later. Okay. <laughs> I like, well, I want a Hangout app yeah, that does I that now. I look for that right now, too. I want a Hangout app that does that. That would be so cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Oh, man. So we have a question. <laughs> we have a question from Thomas. Uh, what kind of power do you need to detect something as weak as a gravity wave? What, what, what are you using to, to do this detection? Yeah, so what we're actually looking for is tiny changes in the rate at which these pulsars appear to be ticking. And you can kind of think of it like GPS. GPS works by basically um, looking at signals sent from satellites around the Earth and, and um, basically looks for a correlation between signals from different satellites and uses that to try and determine your position on the Earth. We're looking for doing something very similar with the pulsars. It, it, in, in the example, we just have, let's say, two pulsars, uh, one you know, here and one here, and the Earth is in the middle. And the gravitational wave passes by, and that gravitational wave actually causes your telescope to move very, very slightly. Um, it causes the, causes the whole Earth to deform, really. And so if the Earth shrinks a little bit, then it's going to seem like those pulsars, uh, the signal from those pulsars is taking um, a little bit longer to get to your telescope. And if it expands a little bit, it's going to seem like it's taking a little bit less time just because the pulses uh, tra don't travel as far. So it's really a change in the, the, the travel time of the pulses to get to the Earth because of these tiny deformations. Um, now, if you just saw this happening for one pulsar, you might say, well, that's just the pulsar being weird because they're not perfect clocks. You know, they have intrinsic noise associated with them. And by noise, I mean they're shaky, basically, in terms of uh, you know, the regularity with which their pulses come in. They're very good. They rival atomic clocks, but there's still some underlying um, jitter there. So what we do is, is we're looking at pulsars spread across the sky, and we can make a prediction for the exact um, way in which pulses from these different pulsars should correlate with each other based upon how they're separated on the sky. And so there's um, you know, a mathematical formula you can run through that predicts the signal you should see, and that's what we're really looking for. Okay. And that's why we want lots of pulsars. It's, it's what we call the pulsar timing array, the, this uh, process of trying to basically measure when the pulses arrive at the Earth and use them to model physical effects. It's called pulsar timing. Um, and in that sense, it's sort of a passive telescope, right? We're, we're not putting power into the system to try and measure something out. We're just basically, um, I don't want to say listening because radio waves aren't sound, um, but, you know, we're just basically looking for the, uh, for the signal um, to manifest itself. But because it is so weak, it takes time to build up sensitivity. Again, you want more pulsars. And there's all kinds of other stuff that could mimic a gravitational wave signal in some way or, or, or could just basically swamp it out. Not so much mimic it, but, but make it undetectable. And you can try and model those other systematic uh, effects out, but you need to understand them very well. One of these things is space weather. A lot of people mm -hmm. think space is empty, but space is not really truly empty. There's a thin uh, plasma of electrons in space, and they cause they affect the the pulsar signal as it travels to the Earth. And depending on how what the weather is like in space, it can it can cause that signal to be a little bit delayed compared to what your your baseline model would predict, or maybe come a little bit early. And so all of these types of effects are things that we need to understand in great detail. 
So you're using the the array of pulsars in space as your part of your detection instrument. You're not. Yeah, the pulsars you, you really are the, the gravitational telescope. wave telescope. Yeah. The, the radio telescopes are used to, met, to detect the pulsars, but we're really using the pulsars themselves as as the detector. Right. Um, right. Another gravitational wave experiment is called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer for Gra Gravitational Observatory, I think. Um, this is a ground-based detector that's looking for very tiny changes on these two perpendicular arms mm -hmm. that are each four kilometers long, um, using lasers to, to measure the distance, that, or basically the length of those two arms. Um, the pulsars and the Earth kind of form a system like this, where each pulsar connects to the Earth in this, in, in this system, um, and that forms one baseline. Um, but we're really, at this point, only sensitive to the changes at the Earth. Um, so we're not, we're, we're, we're only affecting, uh, detecting the uh, effect on the Earth of the gravitational wave signal, not on the pulsar itself. We could use the pulsars as well, but that requires very accurate information about their exact distance from the Earth. Right, right. I want to remind everyone watching, if you want to ask a question, you can use the YouTube page. Um, Chris Rand asks if you have a logo you can put on his race kit. He's doing a triathlon, and he put the CosmoQuest logo on his race kit. So. Did he really? <laughs> yes, he did get in contact with, with Brian, I guess, if you want the Nanograph logo on there, too. There, um, there, is, a, there is a logo. You can actually find it on the website. You could probably just... I don't, I don't think that we're going to um, argue with free, free publicity or anything. <laughs> like that. We're sending him an ESSA calendar once... I don't know, they're still in Texas somewhere. I need to get my <laughs> hands on them. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can use the, the YouTube uh, comments to, to, um, to ask us a question. You can use the hashtag learning space on Twitter or use the uh, event page where I'm also posting links. Uh, I will add the links to the YouTube um, description as well once I'm done with the broadcast. So be sure to ask any questions uh, there. I'm checking what we have. Um, uh, Russell Bateman says that laser point is attached to a drill. Might be a good demo to show what a pulsar looks like. The laser lighthouse. Yeah, I wonder if that would work or if it would like uh, go Shoot flying off. off the drill. You have to make sure it's it's balanced pretty well, or else it might work off. But uh, I think I know what we're doing in the garage this weekend. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty, that would be pretty cool. Be careful. And, and that would actually be like millisecond uh, pulse pulsar periods too, probably or close to it. I don't know how actually. Yeah how fast a laser, a laser bit spins, but that's one way you can find out. Yeah. Um, and I know there, there are a lot of, um, I know this gets into the radio waves, they're not sounds, they're, they're light thing, misconception, um, but there are a lot of pulsar, pulsar signals that have been translated into sound, which mm -hmm. is also, I think, an interesting way of, of describing how they work. You get the beat, 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 beat of the slow ones. Um, but that that requires the extra explanation of you know we're not actually listening with a radio mm -hmm. telescope. Yeah. But those could be helpful in, in demonstrations as well. Um, oh, I wanted to ask. Uh, this is off the. Well, maybe it's not off the education topic a bit. Um, we know that the National Science Foundation has recently had to look over its investments um, with a a more scrupulous eye, even before sequester. Um, and there is talk of, of divesting or, or, or the NSF, National Science Foundation, no longer um, putting investment into the Green Bank Telescope. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how, how sure-footed everything is at this point, but that is definitely something that's being talked about. Um, and, and if this happens, how is this going to affect Nanograv as this is one of your two telescopes? Yes, it would be a big blow um, for the project. Uh, because we rely on both the Green Bank Telescope and Arecibo. Now, again, the GBT is you know, one of the best pulsar telescopes in the whole world. Um, and because it can see the whole sky, whereas Arecibo can only see a small patch of it, um, there's certain pulsars that we can't observe with Arecibo that are important to the, the pulsar timing array. Um, there are prop telescopes in Europe um, that can also see the same parts of the sky. There are similar latitudes. Um, and there are some really great systems that are built for those telescopes. But I think right now the GBT, um, other than Arecibo, is, is still uh, sort of the, the ideal instrument to use um, for, for, this sort of a, for this sort of a project. And so if we were to lose the GBT, it would definitely be a major setback um, to the detection of gravitational waves. It would definitely mean that we would have to rely more on our partners in Europe, 
um, as well as new efforts um, with telescopes that are being built in, uh, like China, I know is, is building um, some, some large radio telescopes in the near future. Um, but in terms of the time to detection, I think probably, um, and it would also mean less involvement for astronomers here in the United States, ultimately. Um, and, and so and there's the a website that I'm sure you've probably talked about before. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that's a really good point that you know, the undergrad has a lot of student involvement, not just with high school students, but with undergraduates and graduate students as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's basically taking out a, a great resource for them to, to learn and to eventually you know, move into, a, into professional astronomy. Um, so there's a website that you probably talked about before, Save the GBT. Org that people can go to. Um, but one of the things that we're really trying to emphasize is that it's not just the GBT. It's science funding in general that you know, we would like to see more resources devoted to. Um, you know, if we were to find money to support the GBT, it's going to have to come from someplace else. And yeah. you know, there's a lot of great science that is being done by a lot of great people. Mm -hmm. And we would obviously like to be able to do more of it and, and to support the commitments, you know, that, that, that are already there. Um, it's a very difficult situation because budgets are tight and, and there's a lot of, of great things that people want to do. <laughs> so the best way is to try and support basic research at all levels. Yeah, so I, I included the link to that as well. It's, it's a tough, tough, like I said, even before the sequester came down, it's a tough situation. Um, so, you know, I was just at the Atacama Large Millimeter Ray, um, which is a, a, a project that has been funded partially by the NSF. And a lot of money goes into that, uh, and, and the concern is that the operating costs for that are taking up so much of the budget that, you know, not just that project, but lots of big projects, because, you know, this kind of science we're mm -hmm. doing requires bigger and bigger telescopes, and so how do yeah. you get everyone's science goals in when you have these large telescopes coming to light? Um, it's, it's, it's a tough, tough battle. Uh, yeah, and I think it's really important to support the smaller projects in addition to the large ones. Absolutely. The large ones have a huge impact, and there's, there's no denying that, but a lot of really great discoveries have come out of relatively small projects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, planet detection is a great example of this. Kepler is doing great work, and that's a fairly large space mission, um, although not, not the largest by any measure. Um, I guess as far as NASA missions go, it's probably not um, it's probably fairly modest, or at least oh, average. Oh yeah, compared to um, okay, compared to space telescopes, the kind of money that yeah. that's my thing, right? Ground-based telescopes, you get a lot of bang for your buck. Oh sure, it's yeah, on yeah. The ground. yeah. But um, I was just talking about just Kepler compared to, oh, to something yeah. like Hubble or JWST. It's pretty modest. Um, right. But you don't you don't even need Kepler to do the great work that the that the planet hunters are, are doing. You know, a lot before Kepler came along, a lot of the planet detection work was being done with fairly modest um, size optical telescopes here on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and so you really want to make sure that you fund those small projects because those are the places, like you said, that students can really cut their teeth and um, do hands-on work with large projects and large collaborations. Um, just by the very nature of them, they answer really great questions. They're very high impact. But if you're a student, it can sometimes be difficult um, to really carve out a space for yourself. Um, so we need to support those types of resources at all levels, I think. I think you and I have both come from smaller projects as grad students and found them oh, immensely yeah. rewarding. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for my PhD, I, mm -hmm. I used the, the GBT um, almost exclusively, mm -hmm. um, so it has a special place in my heart, obviously. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about your so. background and, and what brought you into, mm -hmm. into this project? Uh, sure. So, Um, I studied pulsar astronomy at the University of Virginia, which is uh, where I met Nicole. Um, oh, wah -wah. So it, next door is National Radio Astronomy Observatory, which operates the, the VLA. I guess it's the, the JVLA now, but I'll never get no, used to it. No, it's called, no, no, um, it's the VLA. I've been, the, the Green Bay. I've been corrected. <laughs> it, is, it is the VLA? The, the okay. name no, so is okay Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array. The acronym stays VLA. I've been corrected. <laughs> okay. Yes. That's good to know. Yes. Um, and so uh, I, I, you know, when I got to grad school, I was looking for research projects, and I, and I thought pulsars were, were really cool. Mm -hmm. So I got involved in pulsar searching. Um, um, both in sort of large surveys as well as in targeted surveys of some things. Um, and then I also have always been interested in 
education and public. So that's how I got involved with the Pulse Research Collaboratory and with a lot of other uh, education projects in grad school. And so NanoGrab was a project that uh, I wasn't really that heavily involved in in grad school. Um, but as a postdoc, I wanted to get more involved with it because I think it's such a cool project. And uh, they needed someone to really kind of spearhead their education and public outreach efforts. And that was something that I was really uh, happy to do. So that's where I, how I came to the current project. Well, Ryan, go back even further. <laughs> Can you man, think of yourself again as a high school student? Go back even further. Student. Yes, go way back. Because we do a yeah. lot of work, and it's so important to sort of get kids, you know, when they're younger, um, to at least be aware of science career possibilities. So, you know, a young kid that is maybe interested in science but doesn't know, like, what path to take or or even just, you know, what sparked your interest maybe at that age or whatever age it was. But So for younger kids, you know, yeah. what, what might get them to where you are so, today? What's one possibility? So I will, I will share a, a personal <laughs> sort of story. Story, um, that my grandmother and my mom like to tell, and they claim. <laughs> so I don't have this. I have some memory of it, but I'm not sure how, how much it is real and how much of it is uh, somewhat implanted. Um, but I totally trust that this happened. So, so that we were in our apartment. I was something like two or three years. Her into my parents' bedroom and, and pointed out the window and yelled, "Piece of moon! Piece of moon!" Because <laughs> it was like a quarter moon or something oh, like that. That's or awesome. <laughs> And so they tell me that this is when they knew that I was going to get involved in astronomy. Um, but growing up, I, I was actually probably more interested in like physics, like general relativity and quantum mechanics. And I liked astronomy a lot. I had astronomy books I would read. Um, I re watched uh, you know, specials on the Discovery Channel um, back when they showed science um, <laughs> and not just reality TV. Mm. Uh, I remember that. And I, I read a lot of popular science sort of books and that sort of thing. Uh, and science was always my favorite subject in school, so I just grew up loving it. And I don't know if there's one thing that really captured me, um, captured my interest in science. Um, I know that I've always liked to be able to answer questions. So you know, knowing how to find out the answers is one of the things. That <laughs> That's the first that. step. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, growing in high school, I actually was focusing more on wanting to do aerospace engineering. Um, but when I got started to look at colleges, started to sort of tour engineering departments, I, I didn't think it was something that I was really going to uh, I was going to really want to focus on. And I, uh, I ended up doing my undergrad at Penn State. And when we were actually visiting Penn State, uh, my mom encouraged me to just go over and take a look at the astronomy department just uh, to see what it was like. Maybe see if we could sit down with a professor or something like that. So um, we did that and. I decided that was something that I, that I thought I would want to do. So that's what I ended up uh, majoring in. And um, in that sense, I sort of meandered into it without a whole lot of direction. Um, and, but I, I loved it, you know, it, especially you know, as I got more into it um, and I started to get to do some research. Um, it was very rewarding. And especially being able to do the education and the, and the outreach sorts of things too, because people love astronomy. And yeah. since I love answering questions, it's great for people to actually want to know the answers too. <laughs> um, so that was what really, um, like I said, I sort of just wandered, and, and, and that's the path that I ended up kind of stumbling across. But it, there wasn't this this you know, um, big plan that I had or anything like that. And even with grad school, you know, I I had. A few choices where I wanted to go to grad school. Um, I decided to go to the University of Virginia. We threw um, the best parties. <laughs> you, the parties. The parties. It was good. It was good visit. We good visiting week. There were parties. Wait a minute. Well, at least for the perspectives. At least yeah. for the perspectives were in town. We threw a party. Um, <laughs> the rest of the time we drudged. <laughs> we had fun every now and then. We did. We did. Okay. Um, <laughs> And I, I didn't go in specifically knowing that I wanted to study pulsars. Again, it was something that just sort of caught my interest. And so I guess I've, I've, I've followed where my interests were at the time. Um, and it's you know, been pretty good for me so far, I think. Um, I'm very happy with, with where it's, it's taken me anyway. Um, but growing up, I was, I was like, oh, I'm going to... It was totally naive, and I'm always embarrassed to say it now. But I thought that I was going to become like some sort of like general like relativist or some sort of quantum theorist, and I was going to make some sort of fascinating discovery, and I was going to win the Nobel Prize. You are not the only one, Ryan. <laughs> looking back on it, I just 
you know, I, I didn't really have a concept of, of, of what all of that entailed. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was sort of, like I said, I watched the popular TV shows and I thought I had some sort of understanding of the, of the, of the concepts and that kind of thing. And I guess I did at some level, but, um, you know, definitely not at the level that the people that I have met in my career understand these types of things. There are some yeah. brilliant, brilliant people out there. <laughs> and I'm just happy to, you know, be along for the ride and, and get to meet some of them sometimes. Well, that's great because I th and it's great that you did kind of wander around and, and like you say meander into it because I know a lot of people you know kind of feel that way and sometimes when you feel that way you wonder if it's you know if you're doing the right thing if this is the right path for you mm -hmm. um, a lot of people feel like you know I have to have some sort of lightning bolt idea or you know motivation from the blue when I'm young you know that tells me I have to be an astronomer and and a lot of people do you know take different paths and go here and there and, and they kind of end up, you know, in the right place by just following, you know, what they like to do. Yeah, exactly. They like. So it's, it's a different path for everybody, but it's good. It's really great for students, especially to know that there's, there's all different ways to get there. I think you want to do what makes you happy. Um, and you, need, you, know, you need to plan for the future on some level, but you know, you also want to do what's making you happy in the moment. And yes. if you were, you know, I learned that if you worry too much about what's going to happen in the future, you're going to get bogged down in that, and so it's best to, to you know, just sort of try and make the best of the situation that you're in right now. It's good to um, cool. take it. I've been to, I've the advice I've gotten is to uh, take advantage of the opportunities as they come up. It sounds like you did that. Mm -hmm. You were at Penn State. You thought you know your mom said, "Hey, check out the astronomy department." So you did. Yeah. So you, you take advantage of those things in the moment because you you don't know where it's going to lead. And a lot of people do grow up wanting to be astronomers. That they know that that's what they want to do. And like I said, I've always, I was always interested in astronomy. Um, so it's not like it just came to me out of nowhere. Um, but a lot of people, they, you know, they, they watched Cosmos when they were younger or, or something. They had some sort of moment where it just clicked and that was this, their singular focus from there on out. Mm -hmm. Um, but everybody comes by it in different ways. There's no one path that you take. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, so I wanted to, uh, ask you if you could share with us once again where people can find you and your work or where they can find the nanograph um, stuff where they can check that out. Yeah, so um, nanograph has a web page, nanograph.org. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, we're in, in the process of trying to add more outreach um, content to that. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, we have a Facebook page. The handle is just nanograph. Um, and yeah. we're going to be posting, again, podcasts, interesting links that we find. Um, and YouTube videos there. So that's probably going to be the best way for people to stay up to date. And we'll be sharing information from our par partner projects, the National Pulsar Timing Array, the European Pulsar Timing Array, um, the Parks Pulsar Timing Array. The, that, that Pulsar Timing Array acronym gets used an awful lot in these things. <laughs> um, and so that's also a great way to, to keep up to date with what's uh, happening um, with our international colleagues as well. And uh, one of our Nanograv members, um, Michael Coop, who is a grad student at Penn State. Uh, he has a YouTube channel where we'll be uh, putting up a lot of the videos, um, at least for now. And that's Physicist Michael is his uh, YouTube channel name. So people Physicist can find that, that type of stuff there. Cool. And the podcasts are on the iTunes store. So if you search for Nanograv in the iTunes store, I think you should be able to find them there as well. Very cool. Um, yeah, again, I'll put those links. I'm throwing them up in the event comments, and I'll add them to the... Uh, description on the YouTube show on my channel and then eventually on the CosmoQuest channel. So that should all be there uh, for those of you watching later. Um, any, actually, I, I, we got one off topic question and I wanted to run it by you. <laughs> if you don't mind, an off topic dark Off topic questions are the best. Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> the question from Kurt Lewis is. And I've been thinking on my back of my brain's been thinking on this. There are huge clouds of dark matter in galaxy clusters, okay? And dark matter has mass and gravity. It has mass and thus can be acted on by gravity. Why doesn't it collapse into dark matter objects such as planets and stars? Why does it remain diffuse? This is a question for me. This is a question for <laughs> us. Okay. Um, Bob? Yeah. I can try, well, so I can try. So uh, this is not my area of expertise, but uh, but I'll try and, and relate what I've heard. Yeah. Um, I think that people have, you know, hypothesized the existence of sort of dark matter clumps. Um, I'm not really sure at what scale 
they would sort of fragment off into sort of discrete little gravitationally bound clumps right. of matter because there's going to be some sort of you know size scale associated with something like that. And I um, think with with regular baryonic matter, you get stars and planets forming because the gas has some way to give off heat. Yeah, it can dissipate and thus collapse. Energy. It can dissipate energy, and it usually does it by giving off light. And yeah. dark matter can't do that. Yeah, no, that's so a good that, point. Or or maybe yeah. I don't know. That's the closest I came up with. <laughs> Sorry, well, I think that, I think that's probably largely right. That um, because it's it's it doesn't interact except through gravity. It doesn't have a whole lot of ways that it can really sh shed energy and yeah. come together. Um, yeah. So it stays pretty diffuse. Right. But machos, which are those massive compact halo objects, mm -hmm. um, are those something? Are they are they hypothesized to possibly be dark matter? Um, I don't I think they're made of dark matter. matter. Before by some theorists, um, but I'm not really don't really recall what a dark matter nugget is exactly supposed to. Be. Okay, that I don't know. <laughs> that sounds really. It, it was some theorist giving a colloquium. Um, if he's listening, I don't want it. <laughs> it was it was a good colloquium, but I just didn't really fully understand what a dark matter. <laughs> nugget is. I think I definitely missed that one. <laughs> oh man! Well, there's our there's our attempt at an answer, Kurt. I hope that. Wow. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, do you have any parting words about uh, Nanograv and Pulsar Outreach and education before we sign off? Um, parting words. Yeah, uh, parting. just that you know we're hoping to to build up sort of recognition for the project. Um, you know, we we want it to be something that when people hear the word Nanograv, you know, they know what it means. Um, so we're we're really working hard to try and spread the word. So if and if anybody is interested, um, you know, follow us on Facebook. Give us feedback. Um, we're happy to get questions, and there are nanograv astronomers spread throughout the United States and Canada. Um, so you can, you know, if you go to nanograv.org, you can find a list of the participants um, and where they're located. And if you know if you're an educator and you have a high school class that you would like someone to come give a talk to, um, or something like that, uh, feel free to contact someone in your area, or you can just get in touch with me directly. Um, my my email address um, is on my webpage, so if you just go to uh, physics.mcgill.ca/tilda/r-lynch, you can find contact information. I would be happy to put you in touch with uh, someone in in Nanograv. Um, and yeah, you know, we're like I said, that the outreach effort is uh, sort of in, in its early stages, but I think that there's a lot of interesting and, and really fun things that are going to be happening on the horizon. So stay tuned. Very cool. Very cool. Great. Thank you, Ryan. No, thanks to you guys. I'm Thank really happy so much, to kind of talk. We look forward to having you back because I know you have a treasure trove of topics for this show. Oh wow. So. Okay. <laughs> we look for um yeah, so uh, thank you everyone for watching.